Hey, this is Richard Davies, and if you didn't listen to the last episode of How Do We Fix It, a suggestion. Turn me off now and go back. Part one of my recent interview with Braver Angels co-founder and president David Blankenhorn was the previous episode. In that show, we discussed the Braver Angels' origin story and why this volunteer-led citizen movement is needed today. The conversation was recorded at Braver Angels' national office in New York. Coming up here in this show, part two. We don't use words Republican and Democrat. Um, we use the term red and blue. Meaning, Red means you lean conservative philosophically and tend to vote for Republicans. Blue means you lean liberal um, philosophically and tend to support Democrats. About 95% of Americans fall into one of those two categories. This country breaks apart if violence increases to the point where we are uh, killing each other. It'll be because those two groups and the extreme leaders of those two groups, that'll be the reason. Our show is about fixes. Yeah, how to make the world a better place. How, how do, do we, we fix, fix it? it? How do we fix it? Did you watch the Trump-Harris debate? You probably did, or at least parts of it. The structure of Braver Angels debates are very different from what you saw with the presidential candidates and panelists on ABC. Braver Angels is working to transform our tired, old, sclerotic version of political discourse and change it for the better. To serve all sides of the debate with constructive ways to engage across difference. We talk about some of those ideas in part two of the How Do We Fix It interview with David Blankenhorn and start with today's geographical differences. Many of us now live in tribal neighborhoods where the vast majority of people nearby are either red or blue. We are now much less likely than we were in the past to meet people who see the world very differently than we do. Many of us even shop at different stores. So one of the arguments that David is making is Americans need to go back to basics and engage in more red-blue civic discourse. I asked him for his response to those who say that the Braver Angels approach of organizing small group conversations, workshops, and debates may be a waste of time. The reason it's not is because we have to recreate what used to be there more naturally. You used to bump into people and talk to people you didn't agree with, and it's the very glue of our, of our democracy. It's the very heart and soul of what makes it possible for us to live together. And if we're not doing it, which we absolutely are not, um, uh, uh, nearly enough, the only way around it is to create ways for it to happen. And so when... So, you know, people say, oh, well, you have these workshops and isn't that nice, but what does that really lead to? Well, what, what it really leads to is creating an opportunity for Americans to do the very thing we most need to do. That's what it leads to. For now, the polarizers are winning. But you said in a rallying cry to Braver Angels supporters and delegates that, that we're gaining on them. So let's walk through some thoughts about that. Why are we gaining on them? Well, because growing number of Americans are heart sick about where we are. And, and uh, the numbers of people who are unhappy about how our political people relate to one another. They're unhappy about how the media works to foster conflict. Uh, they're angry about the number of conflict entrepreneurs there are out there in all walks of life. People are heart sick about this. And so um, I've learned you do not have to persuade people that we're in trouble. People know it. The only thing you have to do is give people a reasonable opportunity to be a part of the solution. And if you offer them that, you will find that a lot of people, because there's, there's a lot of goodwill out there in America, and there's a lot of 
discontent with where we are. But when, when we started, Richard, you know, a few years ago, there were very few organizations in the country that were doing this. There are hundreds now, uh, local, regional, national philanthropists on both sides of the aisle are wanting to spend more money on this businesses, you know, because they're worried about their workforce. So I would say there's a growing recognition that we need to do something. And there's a pretty good sense of what it is we need to do. But it hasn't built up enough to really turn the numbers around nationally. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had breakthrough in terms of, you know, stopping the spiral. Is step one dialogue? Meeting people who don't feel the same way as you do? Th that is step one. And then step two is beginning to take action to affect institutions. If you just mobilize citizens, kind of hearts and minds, that is necessary but not enough. You have to ultimately engage the power structure of society. You have to go into the political arena of how we run our campaigns, um, how con uh, people behave when they're, uh, they're in office. Not to tell them what bills to vote for or whether taxes should go up or down, but again, how they govern together, you know? So this is not about being moderate. It's not like bringing people into the middle. Oh, no. No, Americans, they believe what they believe. They, they fly their partisan flags proudly, and that's, we don't want to change that. What we want to do is to figure out ways that we can live together even though we do have these strong disagreements. And there are examples of this. I'll give a shout out to a podcast episode of, of a show called The Daily that the New York Times produces. And they had a fairly lengthy interview recently with Senator James Langford of Oklahoma. And they asked him about the agreement that he made with Chris Murphy of Connecticut, another senator. Murphy's liberal Democrat. Langford is an evangelical Christian, rock-solid Republican from Oklahoma. And they both came up with the outlines of an agreement on, on immigration. And it was just striking listening to him that even though he really strongly disagreed with, with Senator Murphy about a whole bunch of things, that they were able to, you know, come up with something and work together on this. There are many examples of this, and it's very heartening. Governor Spencer Cox um, of Utah recently made an agreement with his political opponent for governor that they would each put out an ad that the other side approved of. Not just, my, not just oh, well, I'm brought to you by me. No, I approved by my opponent. So you couldn't say crazy stuff that wasn't, you know, you couldn't call him a, a you know, an axe murderer because it had to be approved by your opponent. Well, the, the voters really, really liked it. Another thing Cox said, I've gotten to be a friend with him a little bit. I really like him. In the primary, each one of them were saying bad things about the other, as, as is obligatory. You know, well, this guy's terrible and that guy's terrible. When it was Cox's turn to speak, he said, well, I just want to say this one thing. If the only way I can become the governor of Utah is to say bad things about these fine people standing on the stage with me, I don't deserve to be the governor of Utah. That's pretty good, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. You believe that one of the ways to, to uh, reduce polarization is for both sides to honor the other's sense of patriotism? Yes. Why is that so important? Let's say I'm somebody who thinks that being patriotic means revering uh, the founding of the country, uh, revering the principles that were bequeathed to us by the founders and honoring the people that have fought in, in the military for the country over the years and the kind of lived experience of America. We're American proud because of who we have been as a country and what our history is. 
And then let's say there's another patriot person out there who believes that, well, they believe we haven't done so well in the past. The great poet Langston Hughes, African-American poet, in 1945 wrote a poem that said, let America be America. And in the poem, he says, um, he says, oh, yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. But I swear this oath, America will be. Well, is Langston Hughes a patriot? I think so. What about the man or woman who says, well, the way I feel about loving my country is that the looking back at our history and the founders and what, what, what we let and how we fought to build this wonderful country of ours. That's patriotism too. Is one of them not patriotic? Is it right to pick which one is the only kind of patriotism? No, 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 no. It is perfectly possible to love your country because of where it's been and where it could go. And up until pretty recently, that's how most Americans thought about it. But it's only been now that we have to disagree with each other about everything. That's a depressing thought. What's an example of how Braver Angels and other civic renewal groups are influencing political behavior for the better? Well, I would say on the political area, we are beginning to organize candidates' debates that are actual debates. And if you saw one, you would not recognize them as being similar to what you see on TV. They're real discussions about the issues that people care about. Um, they don't pull any punches about, you know, their disagreements, but it's what we call them Braver Angels Candace Debates. We also have town hall meetings where we actually have the um, elected officials talk to their constituents, those that voted for them and those that didn't, about real things as opposed to these kind of um, horrible, uh, just complete waste of time town halls that have become this wonderful tradition has been so corrupted in so many places. So we do that. And we also have um, caucuses, uh, uh, Braver Angels caucuses in two state houses, uh, New Hampshire and um, Minnesota. And we're going to do three more this next year, where equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats regularly get together to, um, and we, they work with Braver Angels, to just communicate, see how they might govern together in a more effective way um, and not uh, just spend all their time fighting. And so those are small things, but they're meaningful and they're first steps. On college campuses where there's lots of issues to deal with, we were on 55 college campuses last year. And one of the things that we've done now in several of them is become a part of freshman orientation. Denison University recently changed its freshman orientation to include this. And they said, uh, look, when there are people who don't agree with each other or with the professor, we think that's just a normal part of a healthy community. And we're not going to shout at them. We're not going to call them bad names. They're not going to be penalized by their professors for having a point of view about something. Here at Denison, we want our students to speak, our, speak their minds freely without being afraid, going by certain rules of how we treat each other. And we can help you, give you some skills on how to, how to do that effectively because you might not have seen your parents' generation do that very often. But here at Denison, we're going to do this. It's a beautiful thing to see. And all the freshmen go through this now. And they say, this is not just a one-time thing. This is an everyday thing in this community. And so two years into it, which we are now, we have had a role in changing the culture for uh, you know half of the students and to some degree the university as a whole. David Blankenhorn of Braver Angels talking about the free exchange of ideas and how to encourage open minds on college campuses. We have a link to an article about Braver Angels at Denison on our show page 
at howdowefixit.me. More of our interview with David coming up, but first, a word about our brother and sister podcasts. Mani Guzman of Braver Angels is the host of A Braver Way, a podcast about how you, yes, you, can disagree about politics without losing heart. There are some great guests on this show with wise ideas about how to bridge divides in our own personal lives and communities. And another fine podcast to listen to is Derate the Hate with my red-leaning friend, Wilk Wilkinson. Derate the Hate is a great title for a podcast about conversations that try to get past some of our basic differences. Listen to both shows wherever you get podcasts, and if you miss the titles, we have them on our website, howdowefixit.me. Now more from our interview with David. There are hundreds of groups, some local, others national, that are trying to change our climate of rigid political polarization. Braver Angels is not the only one. So does David think there should be a movement, one big structured movement that brings together these groups? Is that a good idea for Braver Angels and others? Or should they work on their own projects? I think it's a good thing that the groups are all out there uh, making their own contributions. And I, I'm speaking only for myself. Plenty of people believe that there should be a big national group, and some people are, have tried to do that. Um, the reason I don't think it's a good idea is because we're still at the phase of um, we don't quite know what is working the best, and so there's no reason to have a one-size-fits-all. There's no reason to try to get everybody to do one thing. The other thing is there aren't enough conservatives involved in the leadership of these groups. So you, you, if, you, if you put all of them in a, in a coliseum, you, you, you wouldn't have anybody who voted for Trump. What's going on with that? Why, why is it harder for, for braver angels? And I've heard this from other groups as well in, in this space to, to recruit conservatives. Because it, the groups don't start with having equality with conservatives. Um, I think one of the, we have a, what we call the Braver Angels rule so that at all levels of our leadership we're 50-50 and we started that way. The first thing we did was 50-50, including the people who ran it. A lot of the techniques that have come up um, that the groups use come out of some form of therapy. You know, we're gonna to get together and listen to each other which is, tends to be more attractive and familiar to highly educated people who had experience with this and politically liberal people. Um, politically conservative people aren't as comfortable often with this and want a more of a debate format where you stand up and say what you think. But most of the groups do the other. Most of them are funded by left of center foundations and, and individual donors. I, I mean, I love them. Uh, but the reason I don't think we ought to form a big Congress is because we wouldn't have enough conservatives. So the main challenge for us as a social movement is to become much more politically balanced. The way we're doing it at Braver Angels is not to reach out to other bridging organizations, but to reach out to all kinds of organizations, including very conservative organizations and very progressive organizations who want to be a part of the solution. So I would love to have the National Rifle Association be a part of Braver Angels, and I would love to have the clergy for gun control uh, be a part. So what you don't want is everybody who thinks the same way about this to get in the same room. You want people who have very strong political differences to agree that the country would be better off if we were better able to communicate and get to know one another and look for common ground. Braver Angels has been going for nearly eight years now. What surprised you? What things have popped up that you thought, wow, didn't think that would happen? The creativity and initiative taking of people. I'm the president of the organization. I'm one of three people that started the organization. Richard, nearly every day I meet people who tell me about their heart and soul that they're pouring into this effort, five, 10, 15, sometimes more hours a week, 
as volunteers and they say, Braver Angels, listen, Braver Angels, we're going to have a local meeting. We're going to do this. And we're having a, a thing at the city hall. And we're going to, I don't know them. I've never met them. I'm meeting them for the first time. Nobody's paying them anything. And yet they just step into this. I've never been a part of anything like it. You know, I would say what's surprising is, you know what I feel like sometimes? I feel like a guy who's standing on a street corner and just like not doing a lot. And the wind starts blowing. And all of a sudden you just feel this wind. And you could be the president of the organization or you could be um, a local volunteer in Paducah, Kentucky, but you're a part of this kind of wind, you know? There's an old hymn that says, not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me. That's the way I feel. That's lovely. Let me push back on something you said, which is that... Well, I'm really going to dislike you and express a disagreement with me. You know what that means? It means you're a bad person. It means you want to ruin America, Richard, if you don't see it in my way. You've been talking about the need to balance Democratic-leaning voters and Republican-leaning voters, and yet the largest number of registered voters are independents. Right. So how do you square that one? I mean, do you feel like independents are a crucial part of this and that they need to be sure recognized yeah. in your process? Yeah, sure they are. That's why we don't use words Republican and Democrat, because mm. uh, what you're saying is right. Um, we use the term red and blue, meaning red means you lean conservative philosophically and tend to vote for Republicans. Blue means you lean liberal um, philosophically and tend to support Democrats. About 95% of Americans fall into one of those two categories. Wow, it's that much. Yeah, it's that much. Most studies show that about 90 to 95% of Americans clearly, unambiguously are in one of those two categories. Some are not, but it's a very small number. In Brave Angels, we also have a category called other, which means that you are not in either of those categories. In many of our Local groups have three leaders now, red, blue, other. So we want to welcome everybody, um, and we want to acknowledge all categories. Are, you know, there, there's problems with any categories. But let me put it this way. This country breaks apart if violence increases to the point where we are... Uh, killing each other, it'll be because those two groups and the extreme leaders of those two groups, that'll be the reason. Those are the two groups. If this country breaks apart, it will be because those two groups start killing each other. That'll be the reason. And so at Brave Angels, that's the division we're looking at. You know, you can think about bridge building in a thousand different ways. That's the bridge we want to build because that's what's threatening the country. When we began this conversation, you talked about the distinction between being an optimist and being hopeful, and you said you're hopeful. In, in what ways are you hopeful? Well, hope doesn't come from reading the tea leaves. You know what I mean? It doesn't come from like, oh, this is evidence that thinks this is going to work. I could give you evidence that I think it could work. But hope is a spiritual value that comes from thinking that something needs to be done irrespective of how it works out. Is there some reason to think it can work? I think there is because of the growing numbers of people who want it to work. Uh, the people listening to this podcast, I'm talking to you, podcast listeners. How many people do you know who think that things are really the way they ought to be in terms of our country being able to function as a democratic republic? And how many people who you know think that we're doing pretty well at getting along together in America? Uh, it's a small number. Uh, most people have a feeling of heart sickness about it. And they respond, generally speaking, one of two ways. 
one way they respond is to say, to hell with it. You turn off the TV, you don't, well, you just disengage. You know, I'm just so sick of this, I can't take it. I'm going to, you know, have a hobby, you know. Another way to do it is to become so consumed by it that you become so angry and frustrated that you just want to fight. You just want to like, let's just win this thing once and for all. And you just become a political fighter. And that we have a pretty high number of Americans who do that now too, especially more, you know, elite Americans. Neither one of those are good ideas. <laughs> if you want to solve the problem, the way to solve the problem is to express your heroism and your patriotism and your heart sickness in trying to build a more unified country. That's the way to do it. That's what we're trying to do. The feeling of that some, we can do something comes from the fact that people clearly know that something needs to be done. It's just the question, not just, it's the question of how to do it in a way that will work. That's the challenge. David Blankenhorn, thank you. Great to be with you, Richard. Thank you for doing this. David Blankenhorn. So that's the second part of our interview with David Blankenhorn, president and co-founder of Braver Angels. This is How Do We Fix It, where our latest shows are focusing on the work, ideas, and people of Braver Angels. I'm Richard Davies. Our producer and sound designer is Miranda Schaefer. Thanks for listening. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.